This is Pinnacle with Beverly Shook. My daughter, who is now in her 20s, I have a tape of her at, at, at age four, and I was asking her a question on the tape, and I had that tape, and I say, darling, what's my name? And she said, Daddy. I said, what's my other name? She said, Mark. I said, Mark what? She said, Mark Goodson Bill Alvin Production. For over 40 years, Mark Goodson's name has been inseparable from that of his producer partner. Winner take all has been a Mark Goodson Bill Topman production. This is a Mark Goodson Bill Topman production. A Mark Goodson Bill Topman production. The talented twosome brought these classic contests to television. Come on, let's all play. What's my line? So will the real Sergeant George Harris. Please stand up. Ruby. <laughs> Emerald. Good. Right. 200. Uh, lion. Tamer. Sound. Roar. Good. Good. Bill Todman died in 1979, but Mark Goodson's show goes on with hits like this. Come on down. You're the next contestant on The Price is Right. On your mark. Let's yeah. start. The Family Feud. In the fickle world of TV programming, Mark Goodson has left an indelible image. I'm Beverly Shook at the New York headquarters of Mark Goodson Productions. And in this edition of Pinnacle, you'll meet the 77-year-old game show genius. A fundamental problem, and that is the show begins exactly like the old show and shows no change. Which came first? Mark Goodson or TV game shows? The answer is, they're almost synonymous. Back in the 1940s, Goodson was hosting Pop the Question on California radio. Goodson moved east to New York, met Bill Todman, and began making television history. Will our mystery guest enter and sign in, please? What's My Line mystery guests included these classic cameos. I take it that you are a performer? <laughs> when you walk down the street, do men whistle at you? <laughs> Hello, Dolly. This is Louis. <laughs> You'll never get to where you are now. <laughs> you came on once, didn't you? I always reserved myself. Uh, in case a mystery guest didn't show up, we were live. And the closest I came before that one day when I finally went on was when Judy Garland was on, and she was not in very good shape that night. And uh, she came in the last second and was in very bad shape, and they took her off to a dressing room. And at 10.45 was mystery guest time, and it was approaching 10.40, 10.41, and no Judy Garland. So at 10.43, uh, Bob Bob came out, and uh, he said, you better get the chalk ready, get it to go. I said, OK. And I <clears throat> get ready to go on and do my figure out what voice I'm going to use to fool the panel. And at 10.44 and a half, Judy Garland came out rather unsteady on her feet. And she said, how much time do I have? I said, Miss Garland, you've got 15 seconds. She said, then what the hell's the rush? What's My Line was a game show that turned everything topsy-turvy. It was a show where a panel of people used as the problem real human beings. Password, for example, came along and used the idea of language. Doctor. Incision. Shot. Injection. Match game was based on the concept of can I try to second guess what the public thinks about something. Tough Teddy is really tough. He's the only man in the world who uses blank for shaving lotion. Gasoline? How do you know when you've got a hit game show? You don't. You don't know? Never. You don't know. Your stomach tells you. And I would say that, generally speaking, my stomach has been pretty correct. But uh, I've, I've gone down the wrong path a couple times, too. For every show that you've put on the air, how many shows didn't make it? I would say one in five probably makes it. That's a very high ratio. We've been very lucky over the years. Goodson's good luck gives him claim to television's longest running daytime show. The price is right. Actual retail value, 
7.95, Mrs. Jenkins, it is yours. Congratulations. I do hope you win this. A new car! And host Bob Barker calls him boss. I think he is, is uh, one of the giants of uh, television and certainly one of the legendary figures of game shows. Thank you, Robert. You know, people say that you're a living legend. It sometimes means they're surprised to find that you're still living. <laughs> The 1992 Guinness Book of World Records lists him as television's most prolific producer. In fact, since 1950, at least one Goodson game has been broadcast every week. Goodson's productions have even gone global. They're licensed in 12 countries. What makes a game show work? Ratings. Um, <laughs> because game shows are inexpensive, and if they're successful, they draw big ratings. I think that uh, the game show at its best is a um, drama or comedy of actuality. In other words, it's really happening. There's no plot that is written in advance. There's no prepared ending. There's always a sense of what's going to happen we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, the audience likes it because it's unresolved, and the people that are up there are characters, but they're real. The uh, essence of a game show is the fact that you are watching actual people in real life tension. Well, let's try my lucky number 21. Right next to my lucky number. Oh, yours oh. has got a trip to Spain. I now. love that. But Goodson's most loyal fans are friends gathered throughout his career. Mark Goodson has given back to television almost everything he took out of it. That's why he's a hero of mine. Very early on, he got me on as a panelist for a couple of his game shows, where uh, uh, one called It's News to Me, where he thought a journalist needed to be. A lot of people have gotten a lot of information they would not have gotten elsewhere by watching the game shows. When we come back, Mark talks about a crippling case of stage fright and how it changed the course of his career. Pinnacle returns in a moment. I would like to welcome on our stage the <laughs> Shalularia. <laughs> you might say Mark Goodson has made a grown-up career out of playing games, but his childhood in Depression-era California was less carefree. What are your memories like of your childhood? Pretty rotten. Um, not a happy childhood. Not so much really because of uh, poor. Everybody I knew was poor, but I was I was. Uh, I was um, Fairly bright kid, I was an actor, but I was a uh, child actor. But I was not an athlete, and I was not, I was overweight. And I was uh, not thrilled with myself personally. And to me, escaping meant escaping from my body. Mm. It's pretty personal stuff you're asking, but I answer you frankly, because that's how I am. And uh, I wanted to, I never thought I would be rich. I really wanted to escape from being uh, poor and, and uh, uh, where things were always a struggle. And my father was always, we were always, he was always sort of going bankrupt and losing things. And uh, we had a chicken farm, and we lost that farm in, in the Depression. And it was, we not sold, a lot of security. Well, no, it was not. And we sold, that's right. And so when people say, when there's, do you ever feel that it might go bad again, that you might lose everything. And I say, isn't it strange? Psychologically, mm -hmm. I do. I, I feel that, uh, that uh, it could happen again. It really can't, I don't think. I mean, I, I mean things could go very bad, but I doubt very much that I would go back to those days. But it sometimes feels like I could. But you're in your 70s now, an age when most people are well retired. Yeah. You don't need to do it. Are you still searching somehow for that security? Probably I'm trying to stay young as part of it. Not security. My work is my identity. 
and my personality is my is connected with my work. I don't have a lot of hobbies. Uh, I read, but basically, creating shows or writing uh, uh, is what it, what excites me. Or not even, I say excites is too strong. It keeps me feeling alive, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I think it's a quest for continued vitality. Your parents were interesting people, though, what I read about them, your father and mother, different types. Yes. My mother was uh, outgoing, gregarious, uh, loved to eat, like me, was always overweight. Uh, my father was thin, ascetic, a man who distrusted pleasure and uh, never ate meat. He, he opened one of the first health food stores in Berkeley. I'm a mixture of my mother's um, Lo her love of sybaritic delights and my father's distrust of them. Your father wanted you to be a lawyer. Yes, he did. For security? Well, he probably should have a profession. He had it all laid out. My brother was going to be a, a doctor and I was going to be the lawyer. But once enrolled at Berkeley, Mark's quest for legal truth gave way to a search for the spotlight. I was one of the only economics majors on the campus of the university who was also involved in the, what they called the little theater. And I, so I, was a, I was a young, I was a kid actor, and I acted in a lot of places. I directed plays on campus. So I thought, well, I'll, maybe I'll become a radio announcer for a while. I did news and uh, variety shows, and uh, I, I rewrote my own shows. I, I, I even had a little game show of my own, terrible little show called Pop the Question. After his radio stint in San Francisco, Mark headed east to seek his fame and fortune. I became the voice of The Answer Man, which was a, a, a show where you answer questions on the air to people, you see. And I did uh, uh, a, a sports game show, that, uh, not mine, called the Jack Dempsey Sports Quiz. Uh, the, the, somebody at, at uh, a talent agency said, uh, Goodson, you've done game shows before. I see. He says, you know a lot about sports? And I lied. I'd, I'd never been to a baseball game. And then something happened one day yes, that did. changed your career. Yeah. Um, and this scares me. <laughs> it scared me, too. I, I was, it was in the 40s, and I was doing about four or five soap operas as an announcer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had come up from San Francisco I was making no money. All of a sudden I was making twenty or thirty thousand dollars a year, which is to me was a fortune in money. And one day uh, I woke up, in the middle of the night really, and uh, I heard a voice inside my head say, you're never going to be able to announce again. And I answered that voice and I said, that's not true. And the voice said, you watch. So when I came to the studio the next day, it was at NBC, I remember. And it was a show called um, Front Page Feral. I was the announcer. And I started to read, and I could feel that my, my voice was drying up. My hands were beginning to perspire. And show after show began to be worse and worse. So finally, at the end of about six months, I couldn't announce anymore. And I had a new baby and a wife. And uh, I had no way to make a living. And what I didn't happened? know what to do. Well, I was desperate. And in, sometimes desperation breeds remedies. Goodson's solution? A radio soap opera based on the files of a marriage counselor. And I went from that to directing all the radio for the Treasury Department during the war. And suddenly I was a radio director. But so it was, a pot, it was divine providence. It turned out to be the best thing in the world for me. Then in 1946, Goodson met Todman and together they took radio then television by storm. This is your first appearance on this show, isn't it? Yes. And this is my first appearance on this show. <laughs> and we can save an awful lot of time if you just tell me what you do. Pinnacle returns in a moment. Here in Mark Goodson's Manhattan home, you'll find Picasso, Magritte, even a Mark Goodson original. 
Tell me about your passion for art. I love art in private homes. I'm not much of a museum goer, but I love to see art in people's homes. <laughs> so do I. It but... seems closer to me somehow than if I see it at the, the, at the Museum of Modern Art or at some other place. It seems connected to me in a way via the person I'm with, and I can't even describe why. And so I, I began, there's a sense of possessiveness as well as enjoyment about art. And you art. create your own stories then about that particular yes, piece. Yes, that's right. I have, I have a, a Picasso from my fireplace in this room, for example, which is 1937, Picasso's Still Life, which is a great little painting. Mm -hmm. And the more I look at it, the more it, it means to me. While Mark's investments in art have been secure, his personal relationships have not. I was going to write a book once called I Led Three Wives. <laughs> Three divorces. Three divorces, yes. Is that sense of... Doesn't make me feel of... great. The few depressions I've had in my life have all not been connected with my work, but have basically been connected with uh, women. I can deal with almost any business problem because they're all kind of, in a way, intellectual. They're all, to some extent, logical, and they all make you feisty. They want to make you fight back. But uh, problems with your family or with women or divorces or things like that are... Uh, are like going to jail or going to prison. They are emotionally enormously disturbing and, and uh, they, they hit you at a very deep level. And uh, people always will say to you, why with all your success should you allow what one woman does to be of such critical importance? And you say, I don't know, but that's how it is. You once said that you can't create in, in domestic turmoil. And yet you've created a lot, and you sounds like you've had your my, fair my share. My creations, my best creations were always when I was attached. I'm very tough on myself, and therefore I need considerable bolstering. My mother gave me that, and certain women have given me that. And when that is withdrawn, it becomes very painful. A lot of the articles on your earlier life, yeah. it, it, you talked about being driven by a sense that you'll never have another original idea, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the insecurity, mm -hmm. and have you come to grips with that? Not really. Never. No, I think there's always the sense, and by this I think it's true of everybody who is creative, and I think that I'll flatter myself and say that I'm creative. There's always a feeling that, my God, will I ever do it again? Do you still want to one-up yourself? One -up, of course I want to one-up myself. Life, I think of life as a, as a wonderful marathon race, and you can't step out of it too long or the world goes by you. Yeah, I, I do feel, um, I, I, I enjoy things. I mean, I... I you know, it's fun to, to go to good restaurants and to travel and to read good books, but the real enjoyment comes in the sense that you're doing something. I remember when, 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 when the Family Feud was worked on in 76, I was going through a period of, of downness, feeling of, that was it, no more. And when I did that, and I finally began to see it coming together, I thought, my God, I can still do it. And there's, there's no greater ecstasy in the world.